We're back, this is Dave Vellante. I'm with Jeff Kelly, this is theCUBE. We're live at the SplunkConf 13. Last night, big party, big customer party. About 2,000 people here, just under 2,000 people. Excellent event. Matt File is here, he's the co-founder of Datastack, smoking hot, NoSQL database company. Matt, welcome back to theCUBE. Thank you for having me again, love hanging out with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so tell us, what's going on here at uh, at, uh, at Splunk.conf. What's your relationship with Splunk? And then we'll get into what's new with Datastack. So on the conference side, it's amazing how many people are here. I think they added 50% year over year, which is ridiculous, and it looks like they're going to need a new venue if they're going to keep this up. I mean, I think we're at the uh, bursting at the seams point. <laughs> In terms of uh, Splunk, so we obviously, uh, Datastack is the commercial entity behind the Apache Cassandra project. We do a lot of products and services for that, and we've got a number of uh, customers who are using something called Cassandra Connect with Splunk so that they can, from Splunk, look at all the machine data that's in Splunk and cross-reference it against the stuff that's in Cassandra to have one complete view of their world. Okay, so, you know, it, it, it's not, it wasn't clear from some of our web searches what the nature of the relationship is between you guys. Do you have a formal relationship? Or is it more just you're sort of doing stuff together in the field? Or? No, we're formal partners. We're doing stuff in the field, all of the above. Uh, Godfrey and Billy, the two CEOs of both companies, are really good friends, and uh, they were actually talking on a panel. Although I think Godfrey was in the crowd actively participating yesterday as opposed to on the actual panel. Yeah, <laughs> you guys are birds <laughs> of a feather. So what's new with Datastax? Um, we've you know, covered you guys and Cassandra for quite some time now, and uh, you guys are doing great in the marketplace. What's, uh, what's the update? So, you know, on the product side, we're just continuing to expand the Cassandra community. You know, we've got thousands of deployments now uh, in production where businesses are actually running their company on top of Cassandra. On the Datastax product side, uh, our latest release offered security inside of some, our main offering, which is Datastax Enterprise. In that offering, you've got integration between Cassandra for your online needs, as well as Hadoop for analytical workloads, in addition to Solar for search across that data set. And the latest release uh, brought security into the mix to really satisfy the needs of Fortune 500s who have strict compliance requirements. Yeah, so you're sort of bringing that enterprise capability to, to, to big data and, and, and the like. People talk about that a lot. And Jeff Kelly, you and I have talked about this. We talked um, yesterday, actually, one of the analysts that's here at the show, Peter Goldmacher, was at the Oracle event, Jeff. Sure. And, and you were telling me, he, he mentioned that he asked the question of, uh, of, of Mark Hurd, what's your biggest competitive threat? And his answer was, not surprising, I think I even said to you, it's going to be internal execution. Sure enough, that's what, that was it. So, Evidently, you're still under the radar. <laughs> so, it, uh, it's funny it's that a good place to be. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for, on one side, uh, we're definitely you know an up and comer on that aspect. But on the flip side, Oracle has an offering called NoSQL. Now, I don't know how many people are using it, but they've identified the space and named a product to try to compete in it. So there's something going on there. And as the 800-pound gorilla, I doubt they're going to come out and say, "Oh yeah, our biggest fear is a startup <laughs> yeah, out right, of yeah. uh, San Mateo." Well, that's their strategy or their 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 playbook, right? Is to Come in late to market and act like you invented it, and, and it works, right? So, you know, good for them. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Matt, talk a little bit about uh, how you differentiate from some of the other players in big data. Um, this is, you know, kind of a basic question, but I think uh, it's important because sometimes data stats gets kind of lumped into that group with uh, some of the Hadoop players. Obviously, what you do is different. I mean, there's a Hadoop component to uh, the data stacks enterprise product, but really, you guys are about online transactional processing, uh, uh, powering web applications. Tell us a little bit more about how you differentiate from, from those kind of Hadoop workloads, which I think are, you know, which generally are more analytic in nature. Yeah, that's a really good point. If you, the worst thing about big data is it's basically everything in today's, days and age, today's day and age that's anything in terms of a data management system. But if you really dive into it, there's sort of two different types of workloads. There's your online system and your offline system. The offline system in the traditional world is the data warehouse. We're seeing that evolve into what Hadoop's ecosystem is today. The online is your traditional relational database and sort of the, the up and coming aspect of that in today's world is the NoSQL space. We play in that online space. In other words, we are the system that is actively running the business where results are measured in milliseconds, not minutes or hours. Mm -hmm. And if it goes down, the business simply can't do business. Mm -hmm. So give us some examples. What are some, you know, some, some core applications people are running on top of data sets that are powering the business that are critical that can't go down? So a great example is we recently held the Cassandra Summit 2013 over the summer in San Francisco, and one of the talks given there was by Intuit, uh, the guys behind various tax options. They're moving and are actually running now their entire data infrastructure for doing all of their tax workload on top of Cassandra at this point, and that's obviously a multi-billion dollar year business. Mm -hmm. If that goes down, especially during tax season, not so good for the rest of us. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so again, and, and we brought up Oracle earlier. Uh, talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of 
uh, trends in your customer base. Um, you know, we hear a little bit about people looking to NoSQL options when either Oracle or traditional databases, not just Oracle, uh, either hit performance, uh, the performance starts to degrade because of either the type of data, the, the, the size of the data, et cetera. Um, but also there's, there's the price uh, component as well. I mean, Oracle is uh, not known for <laughs> being inexpensive. So what are you seeing in terms of people for using uh, the traditional databases coming to you? Is, are they, what are the main concerns they're coming to you for to, to address? Well, let's tackle that in a couple parts. First and foremost, we're in this data age, and Gartner's got the three Bs, volume, variety, and velocity. Traditional relational systems were never built with that in mind, right? Data sets you know, 20 years ago were just simply smaller than today. The challenge of those three Vs as they come into data, data management systems, you can overcome those, but it usually requires a lot of complexity, and complexity inevitably leads to uh, downtime, because when something goes wrong in a complex environment, it's usually not easy to fix it easy, uh, in, in a really quick manner. So, from the ground up, Cassandra is built to handle the various aspects of data, whether it is volume, variety, or velocity of data coming in and out of the system, but maintaining uptime as the number one concern. In the online world, uptime is all that matters. Performance is second, and features are a nice gravy after that. But if you're not up and running, the system's down and the business is down. To your point around cost specifically, I think one of the really interesting things is the only reason this big data movement is possible is it's economically feasible for anyone to store practically unlimited data. For example, if I go online today, I can probably buy a three terabyte SATA hard drive for 100 bucks. You know, 20 years ago, three terabytes would have cost a fortune. But if you're going to use commodity hardware to make it economically feasible to do all these things with data, you've got to have a system that is resilient to failure because commodity hardware inevitably fails. Mm -hmm. As a result, uh, you see a huge cost savings just on the hardware alone in this day and age compared to buying really expensive SANs, et cetera. You can accomplish the same thing by utilizing something like a SAN or on top of commodity hardware. And I think that one of the better examples of that is Netflix, who's running their entire business on Cassandra, on the net, on, excuse me, on the Amazon cloud, which is not exactly the most resilient system on the face of the planet. <laughs> Very true. Uh, okay, so let's now let's di dive a little bit deeper into NoSQL. So there's you know different flavors of NoSQL out there. Um, you know you've got competition from companies like MongoDB and others. Where what is what is Cassandra and DataStack sweet spot in that kind of continuum of NoSQL databases and different flavors out there. Mission critical environments. We've got a reputation for staying up and running no matter what. You can lose a machine, you can lose a rack, you can lose an entire data center. The system will keep on chugging along. We've got deployments that often start as small as three and five nodes, but we've got ones that are running thousands at this point. And so we're really known for maintaining uptime and performance no matter what comes at you in terms of the challenges of some of the largest companies on the face of the mm -hmm. planet. And then, and now, now let's give, uh, you know, just want to pivot a little bit back to the kind of the relational world, and let's give Oracle their due. I mean, it's clearly, they, they're, they're a very successful company and the database is powering a lot of, uh, a lot of applications and, and a lot of core business processes at enterprises across, across the world. So what, what is it that, uh, when is a relational database appropriate and when is NoSQL appropriate? In other words, what are some of the things that maybe Cassandra doesn't do great? So I think that in the day and age when you've got a data set that is, in Cassandra's case, always has to be available, even if it's a small amount of data, Cassandra's actually better at that than a relational technology, and that's because of its core architecture. It's a peer-to-peer -peer based one as opposed to master-slave. So there are some areas where we have customers on 20 gigs of data, which would honestly fit on my iPhone at this point, but actually can have a better experience running out of Cassandra compared to a mm -hmm. relational system. With that said, I won't say that we should always put everything on that. There are scenarios, for example, sometimes financial transaction type things, that actually make sense to put on just a single relational database because it's more feature rich mm -hmm. for doing things with that small amount of data where uptime might not be the primary concern. Mm -hmm. So that kind of back office, uh, you know, your, your, some of your financials, things like that, is that where a relational, you know, they've been, the Oracle database has been powering those things for years, is that where, okay, that's, that's still a good fit and, and sort, sort of the online, some of the customer facing uh, applications is where NoSQL makes more sense? I think you nailed it. You know, Netflix has moved all of their stuff over to Cassandra with, I think, the exception of their HR systems on the back end. And you know what, that just doesn't make sense for us. You could do it, of course, but you know, I can squeeze a square peg in a round hole all the time, it just might be the smartest thing to do. Mm -hmm. Matt, why did you and your um, colleagues start data stacks, data stacks? So Jonathan and I were at Rackspace and we were actually both working on Cassandra from different angles. He was hired uh, to build a distributed database, potentially for product purposes one day, on their cloud team. I was in there uh, 
cloud apps division, and I saw that there were 20 or so development teams who were all spending more time scaling their databases than actually working on customer-facing features. So I was working on an internal service where the we would be uh, or the internal teams would be our customer, and we would focus on scaling the database, provided as an internal service to those teams, so they could focus on core customer-facing uh, features. As a result, as our paths crossed, he actually took me out to lunch one day to tell me that he wasn't going to stay at Rackspace much longer because he wanted to do a startup. I got an into uh, Rackspace through an acquisition of a previous company, and while I was trying to talk him out of leaving the company because I spent about half my time recruiting, he convinced me to leave and go with him. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so that's why you guys, that's how really you guys got together, but why did you guys just choose what you chose? And, and, and what was kind of the, the early defining mission of Datastax? So the, the really cool thing about open source is that there were lots of companies using Cassandra out in the wild. And they were basically saying, look, we see the real strength and the benefit of using this in our company. We really need a commercial entity behind this so that we can trust our business on it and you know, have some input on where product features are going in the future, have someone that we can call whenever things are going wrong on and need support so we can make sure that we're keeping the business up and running. So the nice thing was, literally the first day out the door we had customers, and that's a, it, it, that's lucky. That's the best way to say that. Right, right, because you have an established install base. Okay, so you guys saw that opportunity, you were users of the, of the, of the database and felt like you could add real value there to the community. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, you feel like sometimes the, the Hadoop NoSQL open source tail is wagging the, the data dog. Um, yet at the same time, you see all these statistics how much of the data is unstructured or multi-structured and how fast that's growing relative to structured data. Um, do you see that flipping? Do you see that equation flipping? Or you know, the other big question is, are guys like, is, is the oligopoly or the cartel as we call it sometimes just going to grab up all the innovators and you know, subsume it and try to keep the status quo? What's your, what are your thoughts on how that plays out going forward? So I think one of the things we tell people who are just getting involved in the big data space is that there's a little bit of a learning curve. And it's not so much that you're learning something new, it's that you're unlearning restrictions. In the past world, you know, you can only store a certain amount of data. There had to be structure to it. And it's a little bit like the red pill, blue pill scene out of the matrix, where once you get around the corner and you realize there are no more restrictions on what you do with your data, there's sort of no going back. And honestly, having un unlimited access to data, no matter what size, shape, or form it is, is actually better for the end customer. So I don't see how that's ever going to go away if we can innovate to make sure that the customer experience and end user experience just constantly Constantly improve. So that innovation, the premise there then, there's the innovation and the, and the, and the disruption and the, and the value add, the business value that's going to be created by that dynamic will ultimately become the model of the future. Whether or not it's you know, a startup like yours that becomes you know, prominent, whatever, does IPO and takes over the world, or a, a large company subsumes that. Ultimately, that's going to be the model of the future, you believe. Yeah, in the very near future, because technology is just evolving at a more rapid rate than ever before, I don't even think it's going to be uh, the outlier. I think it's going to be the norm, and people looking back and say, why did they ever do business that way? Do you think that, um, that there is, is, I mean, it's a software industry, right? Which, which it's, if you were to go back to 1990 and had to predict who was going to be the leader in ERP, you wouldn't have predicted SAP, right? So it's, it's very hard to predict, although things are different now, they've changed. As I said, the, I referred to the oligopoly. The industry is you know, more stable now than it was back then. Do you think there's room for a new, you know, billion dollar software company in this space to really come in and thrive and, 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 and survive and remain independent for a long period of time. Absolutely, and I think what you're actually going to see is there's going to be a collection of billion dollar companies coming out of this big data race in the coming years as you start to see some of the Hadoop players and the NoSQL players start to gear up for those IPOs. There's going to be a collection of them. Do you think there'll be a, uh, a red hat of Hadoop? I do, and I think that there might even be a couple. <laughs> <laughs> you think those companies will be independent? That's a big question. Yeah. I think they'll be independent for some part. It'll be curious to see what the guys with the deep pockets do. Because you wonder, right? Because you know, the industry kind of let Red Hat get away with it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and now you see guys like you know, EMC buys Greenplum, you're seeing what, you know, different, you know, whatever, whether it's you know, Microsoft making relationships or Oracle, I think they're, they're wiser to the potential of that, you know, that market value that's being created there. So, you know, savvy your CEOs and boards these days. <laughs> they, uh, they know that there's a general flavor right now where um, 
a lot of these players in the Hadoop and NoSQL space are open source, and that's really attractive to most of the end users of the system. So I don't think that uh, guys with money are going to let these very successful open source players sit on the sidelines for long, even if they go public but for a while. The, but at the same time, their heft doesn't necessarily ensure their success, right? So it's a really interesting dynamic. I mean, the passion you know, of a startup and the agility of a startup, you know, to a, to a point, seems to have an advantage. I completely agree yeah. with that. All right, Matt, we'll give you a last word uh, before we got to go. What, what, uh, what, what thoughts do you want to leave with uh, our audience with on uh, this, this whole space, uh, data stacks, you know, Splunk Comp? We're just really grateful to be here and seeing this conference you know, grow so much year over year just I think is a huge plus for the big data community all in because you see more and more people understanding that this is the new norm as opposed to uh, just an outlier. And the numbers just on every aspect out that from the financials to the number of people doing it. Matt File, thanks very much for stopping by theCUBE. It's great watching you guys build an awesome company and I uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. I'll be back with Jeff Kelly right after this. We're live. This is theCUBE at SplunkConf. <laughs>